Hello and welcome to the Earthly Roots podcast where we chat all things gardening, homesteading and connecting to nature. We're your hosts Diane and Robin. The Earthly Roots podcast acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Okay, welcome back to another episode. We're excited to be back for our second episode of the year. If this yeah. is going up second, I'm not too sure. We batch film everything, so <laughs> yes. we'll, de- we'll decide when it goes up. But anyway, a second I think we filming. did decide that this is going to be the next episode, though, because it yeah. kind of makes sense. End of summer, True. getting ready for autumn, like this mm-hmm. is the time to talk about this. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about um, something that's very relevant now for us in the Southern Hemisphere. It'll be completely different in your, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, but you can switch this around in the seasons. Um, but we're going to be talking about what we're doing to kind of prepare for the cooler months and also just deal with all of the summer preserving and harvests and the busy summertime that is the end of February slash coming into March. Mm -hmm. There's a lot going on in our gardens and on the homestead. Yeah. And it's such a funny time because you feel like you're still being so overwhelmed by by vegetables and harvests and Mm -hmm. your garden is probably looking the best it ever has. And you have to start thinking about cleaning it up and starting the next lot of crops from scratch. So yeah, it, it's it's a busy period of time for gardeners. Yeah, yeah, it, it definitely doesn't feel right to be starting like brassicas or even thinking about the cooler season crops, but yeah. it just it comes up so quickly the cooler months. So it's definitely just important to start having a think right now. Mm-hmm. There's no pressure. Like, don't feel like anything we're saying you you have to do. Obviously, um, we recognise that all climates in Australia are completely different. Like, there are so many different microclimates Mm -hmm. and you know you can grow all year round in a lot of areas in Australia but we thought we'd just kind of touch on what what's happening in our gardens Um, we were out this morning before it got too hot um, just doing a little bit of tidying up I feel like that's something that I'm trying to do pretty much every day at the moment is just do like a tidy up here and there yeah and I know for me, and we were doing this this morning in your garden, tomatoes have been just crazy. Yeah. Um, I find myself, I'm never on top of tomatoes. It always comes to this time in the year and I'm like, okay, I've got tomato leaves everywhere and tomatoes just randomly, I need to tidy them up. Yeah. Um, so yeah, do you want to talk about what we were doing this morning in, in the garden with the tomatoes? Yeah, I was going to say, or you have situations where like your tomato plants just have such a prolific year that they all just topple over yeah all on your pathways and you just have tomatoes in absolutely every spot you can (laughs) think of even places you didn't plant them exactly um but today so one of the main things that we were doing today in my garden and something that i've been trying to stay on top of is just trying to pick off all of the dying leaves or any Mm -hmm. leaves that are touching the soil and therefore the plants like putting energy into leaves that it doesn't need to yeah, exactly. and instead it's not putting that energy into the fruit and ripening mm. them so trying to pick all of those off or cut them off with circuit tears and compost them for the mm-hmm. next lot of um, mulch that you need to put on your garden yeah. Uh, but yeah that's one of the main things with tomatoes with zucchinis as well mm-hmm. cucumber plants all of those dead foliage just get them out of there yeah yeah and that's because the plants a lot of a lot of summer plants are like this they they do need a lot of airflow because they grow so quickly that they just have foliage everywhere Mm -hmm. and that's how the plant naturally wants to grow it naturally wants to kind of scramble around the place like cucumbers and tomatoes they're never normally supposed to grow just straight in one line but that's how we would like them to grow a little bit more if you want to maximize the fruit on them and also Mm. easier to harvest exactly yeah yeah i've also noticed that if you're not kind of um, dealing with all of that foliage and leaves early on and creating that airflow through the plant, your bug pressure does become higher. So at the moment Mm -hmm. in my garden, I've noticed all of these little vinegar flies appear in the last week or so, um, or even in the last few days in that tomato patch. Mm -hmm. 
And it could be partly due to the rain um, or the heat that we're experiencing, but mainly I think it's just because the plant's not thriving anymore. It's putting in all its energy to the fruit. And so therefore all those leaves are just kind of being neglected and Mm. um, just need to go. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we have had a lot of rain as well, kind of, I mean, the other day we had almost 50 mils where we were and I think you had about 40. Yeah. And that combined with a hot day, like now we're having almost 35 degrees here, having a really moist environment and then really hot weather is just, it's a breeding ground for like powdery mildew, um, lots of kind of fungal diseases and bugs as well so it's something you can definitely prepare if you look at like the week ahead and say okay well today's going to be a cooler day but then we're going to have rain and then heat Mm -hmm. you can prepare by going out in the garden and making sure that you're just uh, keeping all of that airflow going in between the plants that'll decrease the possibility of powdery mildew and all the other different types of mildew as well um, because I know in my garden, I'm just having so much mildew on all really? of like the flowers, the zinnias, the dahlias, zucchinis, cucumbers. Um, yeah, the ladybugs are loving them. Yeah. They, they I love seeing it. the ladybugs come over and like attack the mildew. Like that's yeah. a really pleasing sight to me. But I guess when you're selling flowers for aesthetic reasons, like having yeah. the mildew there is really a big problem for you. Yeah, so getting on top exactly. of it's important. Yeah, yeah, it's hard sometimes, and and you can't really get on top of all of it. And that's something again to to realize with with the garden, like keep it real. Like you are going to have yeah. these things happen. It's not like you can prevent powdery mildew coming into the cooler months because it almost always happens, and it's yeah. something you need to expect. And that's just nature, and you know the plant saying that my time is almost done. Yeah. I'm almost ready to you know be Retire. taken out of the yeah <laughs> to be removed from the ground um and yeah in terms of like what you do with those leaves i know there's a lot of like mm. i don't know there's a lot of people saying you shouldn't you should absolutely not compost them i've heard that um, too just put them straight in the bin and w- yeah what are your thoughts around that yeah you know? i'm always challenged by that because the thought of removing those leaves completely is a lot more hard work for me than just putting in into my compost pile but at the same time I don't want to disadvantage my compost pile what I think those statements come from though is when people use chemicals in their garden and so I feel like the mildew and the natural problems that the plant would go through anyways as part of its life cycle is then um is the word exacerbate no exacerbate yeah (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. so it just makes the problem bigger and then you're putting that into your compost pile and so Mm. that I wouldn't advise but I think just a bit on your plants if you're getting ahead of it early if your compost pile is mostly healthy or is a hot compost pile then really it should deal with any fungal or big issues like that anyways I'm no expert though so I wouldn't take my advice um without looking into it yourself and thinking about what you feel comfortable with. But I personally, I compost it um, and I just make sure that I add lots of carbon on top, like straw um, or cardboard to make sure that I'm balancing it straight away. Yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely a rebel and I don't not. I I compost it all, like completely honest. Powdery mildew, tomato leaves that are looking sad, Maybe that's why I have powdery mildew and tomato leaves looking sad, but honestly... But it's not coming I up just, all the time. Exactly. I yeah. I honestly don't have the time and I, I hate putting things in the bin that uh, is organic material. Um, sometimes I'll even just have a pile down the very back of the property where I'll just throw those things and make like a, a no-dig bed around the native plants. There's lots of ways you can, you know, dispose of that material. You don't have to put it in the bin. Um... Yeah, so I, I do compost it all. And it is true that over time, if you do compost either slowly or have a hot compost, those um, all of the microbes and bacteria in there is going to kill off that. Yeah. It's not going to contaminate your soil forever. Mm-hmm. And if it does, it's not like it's going to completely kill the plant when it comes up. You've just got to then manage it again, which you do have to do any 
anyway each year yeah so, and i was gonna yeah. say like there's so many other things that we probably do to our gardens or unintentionally yeah. or intentionally that can contaminate it anyways like yeah you really do have to pick your battles and so far personally i haven't seen it cause an issue in my garden yeah. um i think it is just a natural cycle of a plant to look healthy be thriving and then slowly mm. come to its demise um and we actually are going to be talking about soil health and compost in a future episode and i'm so excited yeah, for that it's gonna be i so feel good. like it's a well overdue topic yeah. um mm-hmm. so we won't talk about it too much in this episode Um, But as far as improving the health of your garden at this time of the year, mulching, which we've said Mm. in the past many times, is a really great way to ensure that um, you're minimizing diseases, bugs, um, and especially with all the rains. I'm noticing in my garden that my soil has kind of like a heavy nitrogen smell. So Mm -hmm. like a compost pile that doesn't have enough carbon, brown materials like dry leaves, straw, cardboard, when your compost pile doesn't have these things it creates like a smell and then the quickest way to get rid of it is to put mulch or the brown materials down so Mm -hmm. in my own garden beds i've been going around and adding hay adding mulch um whatever i can just Mm. to prevent that smell happening and to keep the bugs away yeah definitely yeah again again in my in my um worm farms that's been happening as well i've been noticing after it rains a lot things um, the activity increases, but it because it's so you know wet in the moist and um, wet in the worm farms, it just I don't know. It starts to smell a little bit. Yeah, and so, it's a bit embarrassing, isn't it? At first, yeah. like as a gardener, you feel like you've failed, mm. and like I'm I'm really grateful that both you and I share these things that you know trouble us mm. and make us feel embarrassed because a lot of the time we're not alone. Yeah, and I've heard from our own commenters and subscribers that. You know, these things are happening in their gardens as well. And they're freaking out thinking that they've done something Mm. wrong. But in reality, at the end of a season, this is going to happen. There is going Mm -hmm. to be too much nitrogen or not enough nitrogen. There's going to be plants that need airflow. There's going to be plants that need a cleanup and Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah, so... Be, be easy on yourself yeah, <laughs> because, definitely. you know, you're also going to be really tired and exhausted after the season. We'll get into it a little bit about talking about all the harvests and everything we're doing to, you know, preserve behind the scenes and everything. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there, there is a lot to do in the garden coming into the cooler months and weeds are another one that yes. they can start to pick up or die down. And one thing that uh, is really a great thing to do if you notice that the weeds are getting out of control is to just make sure that you're getting them before they go to seed yeah. coming into the cooler months um over summer they would have had time to mature and grow and multiply um and your best bet at next season by minimizing them is just cutting off those seed heads so if that's all you can really do yeah. if you don't have time just make sure you you get the seed heads uh, and then the weeds will just break down over time but you might start to see new weeds come up coming into the cooler months. And that's a really good time to just make sure you're getting those when they're small because weeds have a cycle as well. They don't grow yeah. all year round. You'll notice different ones in winter time versus summer. So yeah, because it goes thing. back to the yeah. point that weeds are just plants in the wrong place. Yeah. There's a lot of people around the world and in different countries, different areas where there's certain things that you might consider a weed that they Mm -hmm. love and they thrive with and they love cooking with or adding into their salads. Um, Like even nasturtiums in some areas Mm -hmm. can be considered a weed while I love the look of them in my garden and I welcome them. Um, But I can also see that getting out of control if I'm not managing it. So the, the thing with weeds is if you, like you said, you get them before the seeds if you don't want them. You use them as mulch, as green manure in your compost piles. Um, yeah. You can stay ahead of it without it becoming an issue if you don't want them in certain places. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, nasturtiums are a problem around us. Really? I find in the riparian areas, yeah, like down the very back of our property where it's a bit where I can see that the water pools, they just go crazy. So I'm constantly like picking them out. Tell you something yeah. that I found that's really cool and it goes with preserving things. Um, I, my nasturtiums went absolutely crazy and I knew if I didn't handle the seed pods quick enough that mm-hmm. there'd be even more um, and it'd be yeah. a bit out of control. So I 
took it upon myself to try use every part of the nasturtium uh, like plant, yeah, which awesome. you can. And so the flowers I used, um, I made some of your nasturtium mm-hmm. jelly. I made a syrup though. Um, delicious. It is. It's mm-hmm. so good. So I did that. I also then picked off all of the seed pods mm-hmm. and those were what I was mainly experimenting with this time. I ended up freeze drying some of them. Mm. Have you ever had those like wasabi pea? I love them. They're so yummy. Yeah. So my idea yeah. was to create something similar where instead of having a pea that's then covered in wasabi paste, you have a seed pod that already has that like radish flavor yeah, to nice. it. Mm. It doesn't quite have the texture because <laughs> I don't have a freeze dryer, but like it's a really lovely snack. Yeah. I'll have to let you try some I in a moment. Love that. Yeah. Because people use them as like capers as well, don't yes, they? Yes. Like and that's another thing and... that I tried. But yeah. It had a bit of a smell to it when I did okay. it. So I was kind of like, oh, I don't know. Yeah. So I'm yet to try them properly. Mm. Um, but yeah, like just That's get cool. creative with preserving things so that you're managing an overload of yeah. one thing. Yeah. And I think if, if you are overwhelmed at your harvest, you don't have to preserve everything is mm. the thing. Like don't feel like That's you do true. and you need to use everything in your garden just choose things that you personally are really interested in that you might want to try Mm. like whether it's you know a sweet preserve like a jam or something like that or um like making tomatoes is a really great one to preserve i'm personally not someone who does a lot of preserving it's something i would really like to learn though it's a goal of Um, yours this year isn't it yeah yeah previously i've um and this is also because of the climate we lived in back in the subtropics where we used to live because it was so warm I found like I started to do a little bit of preserving and I just found a lot of the jars got a bit moldy and Mm. I mustn't have cleaned the jars properly and I'm I'm not I'm not great at cleaning the jars I'm I'm quite lazy when it comes to all of that. Yeah. I don't have all of the you know cleaning and the water bath big pots and things like that that you use to really have that seal I'll just have it as a natural seal kind of thing when you're preserving things well water bath like canning is really not too hard if you think Mm. about it like if you really break it down (laughs) pause for geese geese in the background (laughs) I know that that (laughs) would be really loud (laughs) um water bath canning doesn't have to be too hard though like if you really break it down you take away all the specialized equipment All you really need is a big pot of boiling water, Mm -hmm. something on the bottom to keep your jars from touching the bottom so that they don't like burn and burst. Mm -hmm. And then all you have to do, jar up whatever you want to create. Usually if you're using vinegar or sugar, um, so Mm -hmm. like tomatoes are a really easy one to can because they're so acidic naturally, but adding vinegar, sugar, or even lemon and following a recipe that is meant for water bath canning and then just putting it into your jar, putting it into that boiling water for, I think it's like 10 or 20 minutes. That's all you need to do. And then you leave it out on a towel to naturally seal. Yeah. Um, I don't know why it just seems so... It does. It does sound so daunting. And I don't know why. I was really daunted at first as well until Mm. I started. Mm. Yeah, I definitely need to just to just try it i i would always prefer to do things like um like a fridge pickle where you don't need to do the seal on like cucumbers or tomatoes or beetroot something like that where you just you make the brine um Mm -hmm. and then you just pour it over the cucumbers or something like that and then just put it in the fridge yeah but then you just don't have that for the long a long amount of time yeah Yeah. And while that's amazing, I feel like if you're wanting to preserve a big harvest, Mm -hmm. you're eventually going to run out of fridge space. And so you'll be looking at alternatives. Um, And that's where hopefully this episode can enlighten us on some different ways that we can also preserve the harvest, um, especially with at the moment where probably a lot of us are overwhelmed or have been overwhelmed with zucchinis, Mm -hmm. cucumbers, tomatoes very soon will be overwhelmed with things like green beans and pumpkins Um, and so finding ways to preserve these things in different ways I think is Mm. just 
going to be necessary. Yeah. And this also goes for people who aren't growing all of this as well. Like mm. if you'll find on, in farmer's markets and the shops right now that there's so much more cheap produce and like by no means, I, I definitely don't grow everything I eat, but I ha- I am noticing that there are certain things that are quite cheap. Mm-hmm. So that's an opportunity to learn and buy, you know, a bit more in bulk of something to see strategy. if you actually like preserving and you like whatever it is yeah so that one day you might be able to grow it or not because it's really not worth growing something that you don't want to preserve yeah and deal with yeah. or preserving something in a way that you then don't enjoy because then yeah. you have a lot of it and you go oh gosh now i've got to eat that yeah exactly <laughs> i've yeah. had that happen to me in the past mm. some experiments just don't work out and yeah. that's okay too but i really love that you mentioned mm. that you don't have to be growing the pr- produce yourself you don't have to have the gardens you can just go to a farmer's market and get those yeah. vegetables at like mm. their peak mm-hmm. and then still be able to preserve and learn yeah Um, So I did take it upon myself a little while back to write a little list of different ways that you can preserve things. And I'd love to share it if you um, entertain me for a while. So I'm just going to go through the list. Feel free to jump in or pause with anything if you have something you'd like to say. But I made this list because at the end of last year like coming into spring and summer I really took it upon myself to plant a lot more than I ever had before because Mm. I knew that I wanted to experiment with preserving in different ways and like just just be able to not let anything go to waste like not a single cucumber to go to waste if I could prevent it Mm. Um, and so this list just kind of was my inspiration (laughs) to try I don't know, try different things, but also know what else I could do. So it wasn't all all the same stuff. So the most obvious is pickles. Mm -hmm. As you said, having them in the fridge. So fridge pickles, which are mainly a vinegar base or otherwise doing a brined or fermented pickle. So two different ways to pickle vegetables. I'd probably recommend if you, if you've never made pickles before to Mm. do the fridge ones first to see if you like the taste of it because it is kind of the same taste and you can just even just do one jar. Um, And it's, it's really simple with the brine. It's what like a bit of vinegar, sugar, you can add things like spices. Yeah. Whatever you prefer, like dill pickles is a, popular one i love dill yeah, pickles so nice yeah. yeah my grandma always had the recipe for dill pickles as a whole pickle like a whole mm. cucumber um and so this year with our cucumbers growing far too quick and then being larger was actually the first time that i cut them up and tried fridge pickles and they were mm, so nice. yummy yeah so Delicious. yeah highly recommend um so dehydrated snacks so if you have a lot of fruit trees this is a really good mm. one so cutting them up Um, If you have a dehydrator, well done. Congratulations to you. You're ahead of most of us. Um, (laughs) I love one of those. Me too. It's on my my list. Yeah, it's just bulky. So with the bus, I'm like, I wish I could have it, but I can't. Yeah. So (laughs) the alternative is to make use of your oven. Your oven turned on to the light setting or um, I think just below 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 30 degrees or so Celsius Mm -hmm. um, is a great temperature to really slowly dehydrate whatever you want. Another alternative is just to put it out in the sun. I would love to make some, um, you can make like these bamboo weaved baskets Mm. for dehydrating in the sun. So it's protected from bugs and too much sun. Um, Yeah, I've seen like solar ovens as well. Yeah. Where they have those big kind of um, like shades or something to catch the sunlight, to direct it in. And you can change the temperature on it as well. It's so cool. Yeah. And you know how you can have like these mesh like plate covers that yeah. sometimes you might see yeah. over christmas time people That's covering plates you could use that with dehydrating yeah because all you really need is a very sunny spot because the natural heat will dry out that fruit or vegetables for you be able to move it around create that airflow so that nothing goes moldy and then just cover it from yeah. the bugs Unless you're in a very tropical area, which of might not work. Yeah, but and you'll humidity. have fruit up there like all year round. So yeah, you don't you, need you to don't preserve, preserve it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's dehydrating, creating jams and relishes. Mm. Um, another quick, easy one that can be easily water bath canned. Yeah, um, making ketchup and sriracha. So making condiments yeah. that normally you would buy. Mm-hmm. I think that's something that I've really wanted to experiment with. Yeah, um, homemade and- tomato sauce. 
game changer yeah it's so good i made it one year just with cherry tomatoes so it was the most delicious thing ever so different to in store and it you know you can make quite a lot of it yeah yeah maybe you need to share your recipe we'll make it together definitely (laughs) and the reason i have ketchup and sriracha specifically written on the list is because chilies and tomatoes seem to grow so abundantly that you're searching for as many things as you can make with them so yeah, yeah, that was like, this is going to be a problem. Let's get ahead of it by thinking of some recipes. Yeah. Um, this is an interesting one. So turning things into powder. Yeah. So going along with dehydrating it, you could dehydrate it to a point where then you blitz it up in a blender and turn mm-hmm. it into like a really flavorful powder. So think onion powder, mm. garlic powder, chili powder, like yeah. yum herbs rosemary oregano um, Mm. all the things can just be turned into a powder or dried up so that you can use it as your spices yeah i love like homegrown herbs and preserving them that's something that we do a lot of and um just recently over christmas i was doing like uh herb salt it was really it's so delicious and it just like with i think it was oregano rosemary and I think a bit of thyme blended up in a blender with like the the uh, sea salt, the coarse yeah. sea salt, blended and blending it all up. And it just that with pasta, with like some pumpkin, Yum. it's it's amazing. Even so, just like normal salt on anything, just adding yeah. that punch of herbs. Yeah, it's really delicious and a good gift as well. And, and that's something that you can also keep in mind with all of this that sharing and you know trading i could imagine got, how beautiful it is exactly yeah if you've got preserves and things to trade with don't feel like you need to yeah. consume it all as well because i know i can guarantee people will want some pickles or definitely dried fruit or anything that you're making yeah and on my i had a youtube video over christmas time where I literally took every preserve we had or I made a few extra ones and just a bit of beautiful ribbon and just some native flowers and it makes a beautiful gift. Like anyone would appreciate the hard work you've put into it. Definitely. Yeah. I know there's other ways that you've preserved your herbs as well. So Mm. you've done the salt this time around, but in the past, um, there's been a few other methods I've heard you share before. Yeah, I can't even remember now. (laughs) I mean, Um, I honestly just dry them, like hang them up to dry. Yeah. Um... Oh yeah, I've also froze them. Yeah. So now it's coming back to me. I know. I thought it would. I was like, what have I actually done? <laughs> um, but yeah, freezing herbs is something that we also do a lot of. Uh, so how do you and, freeze them? So you can just, you just take put them, them in. Yeah. So you just take them fresh. So there's multiple ways. You can even just. I know I don't really like using plastic, but the sometimes it's feel, unavoidable. Yeah. I mean, like that's just our technology hasn't moved far enough yet yeah. to go you know like we've gotten used to using certain things that are plastic yeah. that haven't been made in a different way yet yeah so yet. if you can use like reusable cling field plastic you mm-hmm. can use that to just roll up lightly roll or tightly roll sorry parsley or any fresh herbs and so you've kind of got like a i don't know just uh, it depends on how you want to preserve it. You can preserve it in different shapes. It doesn't matter. But I usually just have a roll of parsley so that you can um, chop up really finely. Interesting. And um, does it come out fairly similar or does it wilt? No, it's fine. It's wow. really, really good. As long as one thing I noticed, though, if you rinse it first and then you've got a bit of that moisture on mm-hmm. there, that seems to keep the herbs a lot in a better shape. Oh, better shape. Um, I thought you were going to say that it would create mold or something. That's no, if, if you're uh, freezing them. Yeah. yeah not if you're Great. drying them, but that seems to retain the color a lot more as well. You can also just blend all of the herbs up in a blender and then put them in ice cube trays, whether they're small ones or big ones, depending on how big you want. And then you can just take that and put it in a soup or stock mm-hmm. if you're making that or curries or whatever you use herbs in that's a really great way to um to preserve them i usually just like to top up the ice cube trays with a bit of water Water. and that makes it just pop out really easily yeah so it's just like an actual ice cube with herbs in it well i've seen people do that method of doing the ice cubes but instead of using water they've used oil as well yeah 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 because you can do that with pesto like you can make your pesto with all of your herbs and then freeze it in a glass jar or you can freeze it in ice cube trays as well yeah you can do it with tomato 
with paste as well. You know mm-hmm. how sometimes you buy that really big jar mm-hmm. um, of tomato paste and you only ever use so much of it for your bolognese and then you're left yeah. with so much that inevitably gets left in the back of the fridge and goes mm-hmm. moldy and we've all had it happen. Come on. Yes. <laughs> Every time, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so I've seen someone do this method where they scoop it into an ice cube tray and they mm-hmm. freeze it that way. So you just pop it out as you need it. That's a really good idea. Yeah. And, and it's a really great way that. to remove waste as well because you're not yeah. getting those little jars or cans of things you're just one big jar scoop it yeah, into the portions the you need the jars are so big sometimes of tomato yeah. paste and i do prefer to buy the glass jars but you never you go through it them. all with like if you're making pizzas or something like that yeah 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 good so idea that's a really great one mm. um all right so you mentioned before pesto is a really mm. great way to preserve and what could be surprising to some mm. people is that you can create a pesto from so much more than yep. just basil Mm -hmm. and cheese and pine nuts you can use different varieties of nuts so if you only have walnuts use them if you only Mm -hmm. have cashews or almonds use them see how it changes the flavor of your pestos use different types of greens like spinach um what are they called on your garlics garlic Garlic scapes scapes. yeah Yeah, i made a garlic scape pesto Mm. and it was so yummy and this was garlic scapes that i got from the farmer's market because mm. we had already used our garlic scapes fresh. And I was like, I still want to try this recipe. Yeah, and yum. I did. And it was so good. Um, yeah. Do you have a favorite recipe that you wanted to share? Or like the what pesto? are your... pesto? Yeah. What I'm would you terrible when it comes yeah. to cooking and pestos and recipes. Because those types of things, I'll quickly look at an ingredient list. And then I'll just yeah. wing it. Yeah. And I'll yeah. just kind of throw things and taste it and until it tastes good yeah. for me. So Yeah. I wish I had a recipe, but yeah, just a yeah. handful of nuts, um, a good handful or two of greens or fresh herbs, um, as much parmesan as your arms can take <laughs> grating. And then I usually use a bit of oil or water to help blend yeah. it. Is that olive oil? Yeah, yes, olive yeah. oil if if mm-hmm. I'm using it. So then it's um, yeah. got a bit of health benefit if I don't cook it too much. That's yeah. something interesting. Okay, maybe this is way off topic, so I won't no, say no, it. No. I'll leave it for no. a different episode. About oil. No, yeah. say it. Because I think, I think it's important with okay. cooking. Because that's why you add it at the very end, don't you, with yeah. pesto? Well, and that's the thing that... Um, well, oil helps emulsify. That's what you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. What I'm talking about is the health benefits of oil. I recently found out um, from a book that I'm reading mm. that... When you cook olive oil or when you cook like vegetable oils, you're actually Mm. removing a lot of the nutrients from them. So Mm. it all burns away. So you're better off cooking with things like coconut oil or um, grapeseed oil, which can take the heat without losing its nutrients because Mm. something like olive oil will actually like it's better raw. Yeah, I, I have heard that though. Yeah, yeah, or cooking with like butter or lard as well is actually healthier yeah. for you yeah. at a heat than using a vegetable oil that we've all been led to thinking is actually better. Yeah, because I think that's why they add, you're supposed to add your pesto at the very end mm. rather than like cooking it in Without the pan. The heat. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, pesto is something we eat so much of. It's, it's so, so good. good. Walnuts are really nice in pesto, mm-hmm. they're probably my favorite. And you can use things like nutritional yeast if you don't want to use parmesan cheese. That's a oh, really good flavor. alternative. I've never tried yeah. it before. I'd love to it's give it a pretty nice. And other greens like rocket, spinach, warrigal greens, native Australian yeah. green. It's great in pesto um, if you blanch it first and um, it's just a bit easier to, to digest then. Yeah. Like, there's so many different flavors. So Coriander is really good in pesto oh, yeah. as well. If like you like coriander, herb, that's true. which we both do. So Okay, good. Yeah. I thought you were about to no, like, I do. put a bomb out. Like I don't like coriander. <laughs> but I know a lot of people don't. So we hear you, we hear you. But yeah. yeah. But grow it Some in your difference. garden. You might change your mind. It's yeah. pretty good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Some other ways to preserve, um, just canning it. I have mm-hmm. just can. Just can it. <laughs> yeah. Like just put it into a jar, fill it with a brine or a vinegar and just put it like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, pie filling. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Just freezing it, which you spoke about before. Making yep. a herb butter. Mm, my dad used to always um have butter mix it with herbs and garlic Mm. and salt and then we would mix that in with boiled Mm. potatoes or anything really pasta it's really good Mm. um drying things so dried beans Mm -hmm. often we pick beans for the green beans that we then have fresh 
But what you can do is actually leave them on the plant for longer and then harvest that plant in its seed form. Yeah. And like, that's literally dried beans. That's how they're made. Yeah. Which, which to me was mind blowing <laughs> this year. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's so many different types of beans that you can like dry specifically for the dried beans yeah. as well. There's so many different types. I think we need to start moving away from just like kidney beans and yeah. the butter beans that we eat in the store. There's so many beautiful different types of so beans. So colourful. Yeah, that grow so well in our gardens mm-hmm. that you can try for yourself. And yeah, you do need a little bit to, to dry them all, but you surprisingly don't need a lot because those bean plants can produce a lot of pods yeah. and a whole kind of jar of, of beans then. And that's the thing with dried beans. Like if you've ever bought dried beans from the store and then you've had to rehydrate them to cook with them, mm. like one little cup actually makes three cups worth of beans. So it a little bit really does go a long yeah, way. Definitely. To bolster up your m- meals and all the things. Yeah. Um, oils and salves. So this is really for plants like flowers um, Mm -hmm. but I'm sure you could also use herbs and things to make oils as well yeah definitely yeah like and um, like salad dressings as well yeah that kind of oil edible oil yeah (laughs) yeah like add them in and just literally just stick a um, like a sprig of rosemary in mm-hmm. oil and then you've got rosemary infused oil or same with garlic so amazing. and it's yeah game it's changer for cooking. It's such a simple idea isn't yeah. it and people go to the store and pay I know. twice the yeah. amount that they need to mm. yeah just give it a go. Yeah. Preserving it in things like pasta, gnocchi, muffins, mm-hmm. cakes I think oftentimes we think of preserving as preserving the vegetable to then cook something with it later, yeah. but maybe start thinking about preserving it into like cooked things already. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's What's a... What's your favorite that you've been cooking lately? Zucchini brownies. Yeah. I've been doing zucchini bread. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. good. Anything with zucchini, I think is almost a must at this yeah. time, isn't it? Yeah. But they definitely freeze well, like mm-hmm. zucchini bread specifically you can just make big batches and banana bread as well yeah Yeah. definitely cool um so pasta gnocchi frozen meals so again going back Mm. to the fact that it doesn't have to be the vegetable on its own you can actually make up a big batch of bolognese with all your carrots Mm -hmm. and zucchini or a big batch or even bolognese with your tomatoes yeah and then freeze that as meals for during the week when you're busy and you can just pull it out and it's a fresh meal or like a side dish as well. If you've mm-hmm. got like a ton of spinach in the garden, you can separate that into, you can blanch it and then freeze it for different yeah. sides. And that makes make sure that you, you are getting your greens and you're yeah. actually eating all of the greens that come out from the garden. Because I think that's one of the hardest things to preserve. I is agree. Leafy greens from the garden. Yeah. Lettuce is very hard. I, I don't really know how you could preserve lettuce. That's just a thing where it's good to succession sow, I think. I wonder but, if your yeah. trick of the glad wrap similar Maybe. to parsley could work. Maybe, it's but parsley is a bit different because then you chop it up really finely yeah. and it doesn't matter the texture. That's true. Yeah, yeah lettuce might be lettuce a bit a hard. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Something to keep experimenting with. <laughs> yeah. Yep. yep. Tea blends is a great way to preserve as mm-hmm. well. So again, coming back to dehydrating but mm. having a purpose, like being a tea blend. You Definitely. can mix them all together or keep them separate. Yeah. Uh, kimchi. So just being a bit more yeah. creative with how you ferment things. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just about it. Like making dumplings yeah. as well, using alcohol and preserving in that way. So if you have like a lot of different berries or you want to flavor your alcohol, Things like bourbon and uh, vodka, especially gin. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, you can infuse those alcohols with lots of flavor and then have something that's totally unique to your garden. And yeah. I think that's so cool. Yeah, and that's also good for making tinctures and stuff like that yes. as well with alcohol. If you do have a lot of some kind of medicinal plant or flowers, you can yeah. use it for that too. Like the Fever Few apparently yeah. has some really great medicinal qualities that yeah, I'm awesome. looking to... Nice. Take advantage of. To learn about that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, those are just some of the different ways that you can preserve things. If you guys have any more ideas that maybe we didn't mention, if you know how to preserve lettuce, (laughs) let us know in the comments. Good one there. (laughs) Yeah. Did you see what you did? Yeah. What? (laughs) Oh my goodness. (laughs) Oh, let us know. (laughs) No, I didn't see. (laughs) Okay. Oh goodness. Um. 
yeah but for i think we've kind of covered some of the things that we're doing in our gardens preparing for yeah. autumn time but one thing we haven't talked about is seed planting yes yeah i um i always get a bit nervous around this time because i don't know i just it completely just i just don't remember remember that i have to plant seeds yeah. and it's a little overwhelming but because it just doesn't feel like you should be planting like broccoli when it's what 35 degrees outside today yeah and you see uh, cabbage moths yeah. everywhere like the white butterflies yeah <laughs> so maybe we can talk through some ideas on how you can protect your seedlings mm-hmm. in the warmer months and just give them the best head start that they can get great idea um, yeah yeah I've only just sown I did a, a few uh, like spring onions and spinach and or silver beet and something else that I can't remember uh, there was a few more tomatoes so that's not quite winter but mm-hmm. I'm just trialing out to see how long I can extend the sowing of tomato seeds um, but yeah I think the number one thing is creating a an environment where they can not get scorched by the sun yeah or any wind or any downpours of rain that you might have in summer yeah and a great method for this and I noticed that I had to do it late last year as well in the summer period with my broccoli plants is bringing in things like netting so if butterflies are going to be an issue get ahead of them early on and when you actually put your young seedlings or your Mm. seeds into the ground net them up and protect them Um, And whether you use shade cloth as well, especially in areas that are being scorched by sun, you're just giving your plant that head start. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, when we're filming this right now, um, when this podcast goes up, I should be sowing those seeds. So Mm -hmm. that will be around the time when I will start um, sowing brassicas and probably some more onions as well. They did amazing over winter yeah, last great. time. We still have some that uh, we're going through. We haven't. Oh, I we remember. Haven't onions I remember at all. you had them everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we still haven't bought any onions, which is amazing. Wow. Um, and yeah, also just sowing them indoors if you have to. Mm-hmm. I know it's hard if you've got cats like me who like to just investigate everything you're doing. Mm-hmm. But sowing them inside is a really good option if you just don't have anywhere outside or you don't have a good shade structure or something like that to, you know, give them the head start. Mm -hmm. A lot of seeds actually won't germinate if it's too hot too. So if you're finding that, you know, your um, like carrots is one that I know they really don't do well if it's over a certain temperature. Um, Same with things like spinach and onions as well. They're there's so many different seeds that will absolutely just refuse to germinate if you have constant humidity and temperature. So if you're finding that you're really not getting a good germination, it could be your seeds, but it could also just not be the right time. So don't get disheartened if you have a really bad germination rate. Mm-hmm. Maybe just wait a little bit and trial and error with them. And yeah. you might be surprised that those seeds that didn't come up at first will just take off when yeah. the temperature is right for them. Yeah. Um, but that's a really good point that if your seeds are used to having cooler climates, maybe wait for a week where the temperature does drop to get those planted so that they can germinate correctly. Yeah. Would you say that you prefer at this time of the year where there's that transition from one lot of crops to the other, would you say that starting seedlings would be a lot easier than direct sowing into the garden? Personally, yes. Mm. Yeah. I also in my garden I don't have a lot of room at the moment things are just crazy everywhere and I I don't have the time right now to make that space Mm -hmm. and then also they might be a little bit slow to get going so I would rather just let the plants stay in there right now or plant something that's a little bit more established like I still do have tomato seedlings that I can plant and see how they go Um, but it just really depends on your climate Mm -hmm. you might be able to just sow direct Um, you can just give it a go and see what happens but I personally do like to raise the seedlings yeah Yeah. and I think the same for me that at least this time around with my broccoli having that control of knowing exactly where the plant's going to be so that I can net it up is going to be really beneficial as opposed to just sprinkling the seeds wherever might come up and then hoping that they survive yeah and an, another thing as well is to just not sow all of your seeds at the start mm-hmm. with when you're coming into a different transition period in the year it's best to not just sow everything at the start because you might 
we don't know we might have a bit of a warmer autumn and then those plants Mm -hmm. might not do too well so it just pays to just wait a little bit I know it's hard to be patient but just maybe do some succession sowing and just see break them up like two weeks is a good amount of time to let to sow some and then just wait a little bit so that you have plants at different stages going through the season yeah great idea and something else that has been mentioned to us before um, a question that we have gotten is with autumn and winter coming up a challenge that a lot of people have is keeping color in their gardens so summer and springtime are famously known for all of the color and the varieties of flowers that thrive but when we're getting into those gloomier months and all we want is to go outside and see a beautiful bloom Mm. what kinds of flowers or plants can we be planting to produce that color in our garden I feel like you're going to have the best (laughs) advice for this yeah you'll have some too um so yeah we, the reason why we're talking about this is because we got a few questions from Instagram mm-hmm. that we're going to implement in some of the podcasts and just answer a few. So if you ever do have questions, make sure to ask us on Instagram. Yeah, um, if you never ask, it's never answered. Exactly. <laughs> but Kat sent a question about what could we plant in autumn for winter color, which is something that we can chat about and types of flowers and things like that. Just run through a few. Mm-hmm. There, there's so many different things that you can plant in winter that are native, that mm-hmm. flower in winter. True. It really depends on your climate and where you are in Australia. I'm not too sure broadly around what grows everywhere, but I know some uh, flowers that grow really well are like banksias and acacias. They usually have a winter flowering period as well as hardened bergia, the um there's a few different types of them, which is the the vine with those purple, bright purple pea kind of flowers. Oh yes, I know those ones. Yeah, they pop up, and that's the crazy thing that their seeds are just about everywhere. And you'll mm. actually find them popping up in random places if yeah. you live on acres like us. Like yeah, definitely haven't planted them, still pop up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So finding inspiration from natural environments is a really great idea if you want natives. Yeah. Um, and there's some kind of uh, species that like have been um, genetically modified and things like that, like grevilleas and mm-hmm. lots of other different types of bottle brush. If I think our grevillea like flowers at the moment, it's like a beautiful pink and red. Yeah, nice. Yeah, um, there's also just foliage that you can plant and have all year round different colours. So lily pillies mm-hmm. have beautiful uh, new growth and it's sometimes very like red or pink colors they just change in their foliage so much so if you want a complex like foliage plant that also has beautiful berries and flowers that's one you could plant Mm -hmm. as well as there's an acacia which is a purple acacia that I recently purchased it's a cootamundra wattle is what they're called or acacia I'm gonna probably not say this right (laughs) acacia baileyana purpurea I think it is that sounded pretty accurate you did better than Please I help would me have. <laughs> if uh, you know how to pronounce that. It is so beautiful. It has like purple leaves, purple bluey leaves. Mm-hmm. So you get that all year round color. So in winter, you've got something that's just the leaves are beautiful and colorful. Yes, yeah, stunning. Uh, and then in terms of other things, you can plant like pines and cypress if you want foliage. And in terms of flowers, so many different types of flowers. Again, depends on if you're in more of a mild climate where you can That's plant true. spring bulbs in winter. Because I know a lot of those will actually grow really well, like tulips. Mm-hmm. Um, they do need that chill time, though. So just, again, depending on how cold it gets. Oh, I but, didn't um, know that you could plant tulips over winter time. You can, well, you can plant well, them I in mean, autumn. autumn time. They might come up. And it depends on your season before as well. If you've had tulips in the ground, they might get confused and flower early. There's yeah. different tulips that'll flower early and late. Same with all bulbs. So you've got um, like snowdrops are the really early ones. Mm-hmm. So if you want some cute little white flowers, you can plant those. Pansies and violas is a mm-hmm. great thing to add some color all year, all winter. Yeah, mine does seem to grow all year round where oh, we are, lucky. but um, mine die off in the heat of summer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they're great to even just what I've done in the garden is just have terracotta pots placed around the place. 
um, and then plant them in that so that I can move them around where I need a bit more color in the garden or where I feel like it's dying back or a bit dead. So Very that's whimsical. a good idea. I have um, yeah. my nasturtium flowers are starting to take off at the moment. Like the mm. little seedlings are popping up. So I feel like nasturtiums are a flower that yeah they're blooms very really bright, well colorful. over the cold period yeah yeah definitely um i've also got alyssum here so that's a yeah. beautiful little uh, kind of like a yeah. carpet of color that you get yeah. yeah uh stock and snapdragons if you want some cut flowers again just depends on your your climate yeah. but mine grow really well over winter so i'll be growing those yeah i've noticed um, rosemary and thyme is starting to go to flower at the moment yeah, nice. and oregano as well so i mm-hmm. feel like at least early autumn period you'll get those beautiful mm. little purple flowers on them yeah definitely yeah um yeah, that and yeah that's kind of what it, all i had and then other things like you don't need just plants in the garden to create color as well you can have like wooden structures mm-hmm. like you have beautiful wooden structures around that creates a little bit more yeah like height and complexity in the garden which you can then add fairy lights to yeah um to create a little bit more color or add yeah. pea plants and bean mm-hmm. plants that are going to grow well in the cooler months um i find yeah. that my peas do better than beans when it's cold yep. have them climb up and that way you're having that color move throughout there's yeah. so many varieties nowadays that have beautiful different colored flowers i've seen orange yellow mm. purple white so just pick a variety based on the flower that you get from it yep. and then not only do you get an edible plant but you also get that color in your garden too yeah and also you can get like purple peas as well like the yeah. pods can be actually purple true and adding the beans lots and, of color yeah yeah so that that's a few ideas mm-hmm. and um yeah, we can we can do more episodes on color in the garden as well yeah. to chat through. Something like yeah. rhubarb as well does really well True. in the cooler months and adds that beautiful red. Silver beet as well is a yep. cool crop that adds a lot of color as well. So just be creative because we found last year as well, and we've talked about it, that a lot of the color that grows as far as vegetables go in the garden is mm-hmm. really underground. It's all yep. those root crops under the ground that a beautiful colored like purple yeah. carrots and orange ones and yellow and red potatoes but we don't see that color until we harvest so get creative with plant stalks like mm-hmm. the pink celery i think yeah. you planted pink celery didn't you uh i tried to but it didn't grow i have oh, normal cool. celery but pink celery is beautiful yeah yeah so yeah just really research those different more unique varieties yeah, that definitely. do come with color because yeah. those things are probably genetically modified like they've been created out there because people like us were yeah. like we want more color exactly <laughs> yeah yeah and veggies are so colorful you can really, really have a beautiful garden just with vegetables and yeah. a few flowers sprinkled in there because we always need flowers but you yes, know <laughs> for all the pollinators I yeah. agree yeah so we have a few other questions that have come through as well do we want to answer them yeah we can quickly them? answer them we're yeah. getting it's a longer podcast this time oh, but we'll we'll quickly well, we answer can leave them. them for next time well, we kind of answered one, which was another one from Kat who asked, she was on a hunt for trees in South Australia other than calistamons. Okay. So that's your bottle brush. Um, and there's a lot of different types that we kind of mentioned, like that purple acacia. Yeah. Um, I feel like we could almost have a whole podcast episode on native plants and going yeah. over them even you mentioned bringing jeff along and yep jeff whitbird environmental we can just ask him and he can just rattle off a list of different plants yeah and, so maybe we can leave yeah. that one for the future if that's something you guys want to see as well let us know yeah, leave definitely. us a comment or a review so that you can share your thoughts if you want to see jeff on yep um give him a like on instagram as well definitely yep yeah, yeah. and yeah there was another question that we can briefly quickly wrap this up on um from lala effect who asks yeah (laughs) uh, behind the scenes equipment and programs that we use for youtube and podcasts oh again we did do a whole video on uh, a whole podcast on youtube and what we use for youtube so make sure to listen to that one yep that Um, was last season yeah in terms of podcasting we this is where Scott, my partner, should really be here and answering this question. But um, <laughs> I'm slowly learning. But we pretty much just keep it really simple. Mm-hmm. So right now we're filming on... <laughs> what, are we filming? what microphones are we on? Um, stage mics? They, they're, they're stage, like, directional mics. Yep. So it, it's basically a directional microphone to our voices. 
we use Audacity as a program to record. Yep, we have an arm so that it sits where we want it to. Two yep. cords that plug into, I don't know what that device is. We'll so have we, have, to we also have um, an interface where all of the mics go into and that records our voices and we can adjust out the levels of our voices, which is a, a UMC... 202 HD interface. <laughs> Maybe um, we can do like a podcast tour and put it onto our Buy I think Me that a would be cool. Page. Yeah. Or but I, I, yeah, I think the main point is like we don't use like heavy duty equipment as mm-hmm. well. So you, if you're thinking of a podcast to do, you really don't need that much. No. Um, but Audacity is a great program on Mac if you want to use that. Otherwise, we've used Reaper in the past as well to record and then we edit on Adobe Premiere Pro. Yeah, and mm-hmm. we, as far as the video footage for our YouTube channel, Robin just uses her Sony camera. Yeah, so I've got a Sony, I think it's a ZV-1 mm-hmm. camera. To create the image that you're used to seeing on our videos anyway, so it's a high quality, and then you match up the audio and the video together. Yep. Yeah, so that's why we're always, you don't see behind the scenes, maybe we should do a behind the scenes video. For this one. Yeah, of us like <laughs> clapping to start this podcast and um, setting it all up. If that's something you're interested in, we can definitely film that and, yeah. and upload that as like a few minute clip of what it actually looks like behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. It's been a really big learning curve to, to do this podcast because we both didn't have a background in audio engineering or sound or anything like that. So yeah. it's been really cool to and, learn. And it's also, it's something that continues to change as you learn more as Mm -hmm. you trial more you bring those things in but we're not in a studio that's closed and creates the same sound that we want every single time so we do have to work with noise around us and different locations as well and that's just part of it we learn more at the moment Yeah. yeah yeah no but any um yeah any feedback that you've got for the podcast is greatly appreciated like we we're not going to be upset if it's anything negative or anything like that no um Please be nice. Yeah, but do say it nicely. <laughs> but yeah. We are still human and exactly. we, we realize we make mistakes and um, we really love that we do because it's yeah. an opportunity to learn from them. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely want to keep it real and um, relatable and share that. You know, if, you've, if you have an idea for a podcast as well, definitely go for it. And yeah. it's been really fun. Yeah. I think we should definitely, um, and I'm just jumping in there, but we'll yeah. record a little behind the scenes of our equipment um, yeah, of so that setup. you can see what Robin was just talking about and post it on our Buy Me A Coffee page. Sure. For those that don't know, this is a place where you can support us um, just by donating. It, it doesn't it's have like to be... a few be, dollars. Exactly. Yeah, and it just goes crazy. a really long way in supporting us with improving our equipment and the yeah. experience for you. So... Um, yeah you can help us out in that way yeah we also have an instagram page where we post a lot of behind the scenes and we let you know when we have a new episode coming out or anything exciting happening Um, and also just some photos and videos that we capture wherever we've recorded that week yeah Um, usually it goes like oh we finished a podcast we need to take some photos and uh, film some content so before the storm rolls around before yeah storms and heat and bugs and everything happen but uh yeah if you do want to interact with us instagram is probably the best bet because we check that very regularly Mm -hmm. uh, where you can ask questions and we will at the end of the podcasts chat through them um or youtube as well you can ask on there yeah Mm -hmm. so lots of places you can find us and it's all under the same name which is earthly roots yeah awesome well thank you so much for listening hopefully this was a interesting podcast on preserving and end of summer gave you some ideas we'd love to hear what's happening in your gardens at the moment yeah and we can't wait to keep filming podcasts like it's been really exciting just to get back together and film again and record these podcasts because yeah we missed it yeah definitely well see you guys next time time. bye or listen to you next time wait (laughs) (laughs) we'll roll with it